as mentioned, um, we're here to learn more about NYC Open Data. So today's agenda, um, we're going to go through a quick intro. We're then going to dive into a history of NYC Open Data to understand how the open data portal that we're going to be looking at um, came to be and what the state of open data is um, in New York City currently and how we got here. Um, we'll give, as part of that, an overview of NYC Open Data and what that portal looks like. And then we'll get into doing a demo and looking at specific data sets um, and how to really get the most out of the open data site. And so that'll include filtering, visualizing, and using different tools um, to get information out of the open data that we have. Um, and then we'll also leave time at the end for some Q&A and um, just some open-ended time if, if there's anything more specific topics you want to dive a bit deeper into. Um, and then we'll end just with some ways that you can stay involved. All right, um, so as mentioned, um, we're here to learn about open data. Um, these are some of the um, folks behind the scenes who are making this all happen. Um, the material and training for this course was co-created by the Office of Data Analytics at the NYC Office of Tech and Innovation, or OTI, and the Civic Tech Org Beta NYC. All right, so a brief history of NYC open data. Defining open data can be pretty simple, uh, making government data accessible to the public. Um, because of its connection to open data, um, or connection to data, open data is often thought of as a 21st century phenomenon, one that accompanies the growing importance of data in our everyday lives and stems from the increased creation and use of data by governments, both in New York and around the world. But in reality, there is actually a long history of similar efforts to make governments or make government more accountable and transparent. So to understand how we got to where we are today, we're going to go through some of the developments that um, led to NYC open data in its current state. So before we go back, let's start with today. Um, on the screen here, we have a visual or an image of an intersection in the city um, that has some information added to it to help start to visualize what data might look like on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and the idea here is to show that there's public data available about nearly every facet of life in New York City. So some of the points we have highlighted might be a recycling bin or a business or the roads. Um, we have pieces of data being collected against all of these different things that we see. So for every one of these points, um, you can think of that as a point of data that we have available in a data set to explore and learn more about. Um, and I'm gonna open the chat up quickly. Um, has anybody used um, open data before, or is there some way you've been using open data like currently in your life that you can think of? Maybe this, this picture here inspires you to think of some ways you might use it. Ooh, all right, we got one example. Um, one way that I'm gonna share before, awesome. So we had a few folks who've used, come across it um, in some ways. Chatbot. All right. Um, one way that I think everyone here has definitely used it for before, um, if you've checked the weather recently, um, our weather is pulling from an open data source, um, the National Weather Service. So that's just every day if you're pulling that from your phone, um, you're likely interacting with that piece of open data without even realizing it. Um, and as we go through a bunch of data sets, you'll see that you're probably interact, you, there may be many ways that you're interacting with it. Um, awesome, and thanks everyone who shared the, the ways you have used this so far. There we go. All right, so I'm gonna go back in time now and we'll learn how, to, how we got to where we are in that photo. Um, and we're gonna go back to the late 19th and early 20th century. So the roots of the open data movement, especially in New York, can be traced back to good government efforts that date back to this time. Um, so the late 1800s and the progressive era of government reform. Um, in New York City, these reforms took the form of a new publication to share city notices and updates in what was called the city record. Um, and this image on the screen um, is an early copy of the city record. But what's really cool is we actually still have that available to us today. Um, so I'm just going to 
move my screen over momentarily. And we can see here, this is the current version um, or the current iteration of the city record. Um, here you can find, as it says, a database of um, notices that are published here, such as public hearings, meetings, um, sales, and solicitations. So if I open up um, under this box, solicitations, you'll see this is actively getting updated with city solicitations. Um, so this is like a really early rec really early example of one of the ways that data was made public and how it's still grown and modernized and is still available today, which is pretty cool. Uh, sorry, come back in. All right, so if we move a bit forward in time um, to the 1960s, this is when we start to see um, freedom, freedom of information legislation being passed at the federal and state levels. Um, so you might have heard this before as FOIA or FOIL, um, Freedom of Information Legislation or ACT. Um, this made government information available upon request. So if there is a piece of information um, that you knew or believed the government to have that you were looking for, you could make a FOIA request. Um, and if the government had that information available, um, they could then supply it to you. So this was really rev a really revolutionary concept at the time um, because it, it's finally allowing some information to make its way back out. But the important thing here to note is that you had to, the individual really had to take the initiative in this case. I had to know that there might be some piece of data that I would like to know or have, and I would have to make the effort to go and request it. Um, so the onus in that case is really on the individual, but um, this is back in the 60s, and at the time, this was a really huge advancement. Um, so, for example, the image we have here um, was a memo on the FBI investigations into MLK Jr.'s assassination, um, which is really heavy, but it was um, accessed via FOIL and is a really good example of um, being able to get this information out of the government through these efforts. So if we move forward again, um, several decades later in 1993, New York City released its public data dictionary. So this is our next step forward in terms of open data. Um, this data dictionary made a subset of information which was available through FOIL, FOIL. So any information that's stored as data more accessible by providing a listing of what data agencies have. Um, so in contrast with FOIL, where the person making the request generally needed to know ahead of time what they were looking for, this starts to list out what data is available. Um, so now with this public data directory, someone could see a listing of what each what data each agency has and is collecting, and they could read a description of what it contained. Um, and something that's really cool, if you just keep this listing in mind as we move forward. Um, this really was the basis of how we started to build out what we have now. Um, so you'll see a lot of the same systems and databases outlined in the public directory, um, or in this public directory are what we'll be seeing today on our open data portal. Um, so this is just that next step forward, the government's starting to show, okay, here's the data we're collecting and here's what is available to you, what may be available to you. All right, and now we're getting a little bit closer. Um, in 2012 um, is when we start to see New York City open data, the open data law. Um, so in 2012, advocates, city staff, and elected officials came together to celebrate the passage of New York City's open data law. Um, many cities have open data as a policy or an executive order, but New York is really cool because we have this law which guarantees the public will have access to this information in perpetuity, regardless of administration. Um, and the key difference between this and what we have via FOIL um, is that you no longer need to ask for the information. So now as part of this law, our data is made public by default and is shared with everyone by default. Um, and we do that through our open data website, which we're gonna explore in a second. Um, but that just means that all of this data is now listed out, it's available, it's no longer on the individual to have to request 
a piece of data or a specific data set. Instead, this data is out here for you to explore, which is super cool. So with that, um, let's talk about what that looks like. So our open data site has over 3,000 data sets. Um, that means billions of rows of data, ton of information on it. Um, it's managed by the NYC Open Data Team, which is housed at the NYC Office of Tech and Innovation. Um, the information that's provided on the site is possible thanks to a network of about over 100 open data coordinators who are spread throughout city government. So any city agency, office, or commission, including elected officials, has an open data coordinator. And these open data coordinators are very versed, well versed in their agency's data, and they're responsible for working with the NYC Open Data team to identify, structure, document, publish, update, and share their agency's open data data sets. Um, so let's see what that looks like. So from here, I'm going to um, switch to a demo. So we're going to look at the open data site a bit and start to see what that looks like in real life. So, all right. So actually, I'm going to throw this in the chat real quick. And if you want to follow along at all, um, this is the link that we will have. Um, or nyc.gov slash open data also gets you there. Um, when you hit your landing page, um, this is what it'll look like. There's a few ways to get to, to navigate. Um, I like to. If you, say there's, I'm going to step back a second, but say there's something very specific, you came here with a certain piece of data in mind, you can always just use the search bar and type something in here to get specifically where you want. Um, so that's always an option. It just functions the same as search bars you've seen elsewhere. But for now, I'm going to click at the top of my page, this data tab. And once it loads, this is going to give me this nice landing page, um, which will allow me to kind of see what we have available here kind of just browse around a bit. Um, I like to view this as like my Netflix landing page or my, I don't know, seamless. Maybe I'm I'm hungry, but I don't know what I want to eat tonight. Um, I might explore it by some different categories. Maybe there's my favorite restaurant I want. I can just, you know, pick them from the list. Um, but it's also nice to just see what's available. Um, we can also see at the top popular data sets, which can be really interesting. You can see what other people are looking up, what's what's you know popular on the website. And you can also see what's new. So this site is being updated regularly. There's often new data sets that didn't exist previously that you can check out. Um, so it's, it's pretty cool what you'll find on here. When I first started using the site, I usually had something specific in mind and I didn't know that there was just so much information or so many agencies reporting or uh, making their data available. But um, so exploring here has been pretty eye-opening. Um, so I, even if you know what you want to look up, I recommend checking this out just to see what else might be available. Um, so on the bottom, yeah, we have all of our agencies listed out. And then at the top are categories and then up here, popular data sets. So I'm going to jump to um, one data set in particular. We're going to look at some 311 data. So I'm going to click 311 from my list. and given a moment to load. And spoiler alert, we're going to be looking at this first data set. Um, I've looked at it before. But before we get into it, um, just to give a little bit of background on 311, um, 311 is New York City government resource for assistance and general information outside of emergency situations. So they're open 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and they're available in over 175 languages and work for roughly 3,600 government services. And they're accessible via phone, web, Skype, Twitter, Facebook, mobile apps. You can reach them in many different ways. Um, and we're going to look at their data because they, since they handle so many requests, um, that means they have a lot of data coming in. So for this demo, this is going to be the data set we focus on. But a lot of what we learn can be applied to different data sets you find on the site. All right. so. I got to this by clicking agency on that um, data splash or uh, like welcome page. You can also just search it 311. Um, there's many ways to get here. Once I'm on this page, we can get like a brief excerpt about 
what we're going to see. I can click more to just get some additional details. Um, you can also see on the right, they have like different forms of data coming in. So in this case, we're gonna be looking at a data set and we get some brief information here. Um, there's a little disclaimer, um, general description, updated views, and then some tags. I'm gonna click on this. Hey, and Laura. the first, yes. We got a question. Someone asked, um, what's the difference between the data set and a data lens? Oh yeah, good question. Um, data lens, I actually looked at this the other day and now I'm forgetting, but no, I can- No worries. We Feel might want to come back to that. Click. It's not, it won't take too long, but um, I'll point out, Um, so for on the open data portal, as my team understands it, the data lens is mostly like a dashboard, right? Where you have aggregated results that's easy to view for 311 data. The data set itself is going to be a table of all of the 311 requests. And so that's the main difference and why you want to look out for that where Laura was, where she showed you the um, choices to pick between. Towards the right, you have the format of the data. And we're not using data lens as it's already a dashboard. We're using the data set. And you'll see the difference right now. Good question, because I had actually not explored that before. Um, so I'm going to come back to the data set that we're going to look at. And once that, once this loads, um, the first thing we're going to see here is just a more in-depth picture um, of what is contained in this data set. Um, so we're going to look, we're going to come back to this very quickly. I'm just going to scroll to the bottom because it's a good contrast to what we just looked at. Um, this gives us a preview of the type of data that we're gonna be dealing with. So this is a, just a tabular data set with many rows and many columns. Um, and so we're gonna just be kind of breaking this down from here. So I'm gonna come back up. Um, you'll see at the top of my page, we have a few buttons on the right-hand side. We're gonna explore these a bit more later. For now, what I wanna focus on is the about this data set. Um, anytime I'm working with a data set here or honestly anywhere, um, the most important thing to really understand is what, what data are you dealing with and how has it come to be and what is the quality of it? Um, because any analysis you do will really be dependent on how good your data is and how you understand it. So this page, um, which sorry, I looked out, it's called a primer page will give us some of that information. So if I look at this starting here, we have our agency 311. So we know that they're the ones providing this data. We can see that the update frequency is daily. Um, this happens in, is automated in some form. And the data was first made public um, in 2011, which it's been out here for a while. Um, the frequency is important since as mentioned, we know that 311 is correct collecting data constantly. So we know that this data is getting updated um, at a, on a really frequent basis as well. You might see other data sets that are only updated um, monthly, quarterly, or at very different frequency levels. Um, so that might play a role in how you think about the results of what you find in the data. Um, if something hasn't been updated for the last year, maybe it's not going to be very useful if I'm trying to understand current conditions of a situation. But in this case, um, it's updated daily, so we can, we'll can we be able to really see what's happening in a pretty current um, format. The next thing we have here is an attachment, and I can just tell by the link that it is a, we can see it here, a data dictionary. Um, I downloaded that, so we'll check that out in one second. Just before we do, the other things I wanna look at are, um, we have a category, which tells us social services. We have some tags. If maybe this isn't quite what you're looking for, but you know maybe you want a similar data set, you can check out what tags it has. Um, and we're also gonna look on the left, the last date it was updated, which was March 12th, which lines up with the update frequency that was yesterday. Um, the metadata was last updated March 10th, um, which is the data about the data. Again, the date created 2011, and we can see it's getting viewed and downloaded pretty frequently, which is really cool. Um, so I'm going to go back to this data dictionary. Um, I, I already downloaded it, so I'm just going to open that up. Our data dictionary tells us more data about our data. Um, so. When I come here, you'll see there's different um, sheets at the bottom. Each one's going to provide some additional information in some capacity. Um, 
And this allows you really just to learn more about your data set. Um, if you're doing any project, I would just recommend reading through, giving this a quick look. Oops, sorry, my scroll's out of control. Um, this will just allow you to feel confident in what you're looking at and better understand um, the data. So over here, I'm not going to read through all of it, but um, this will just you know give you a more in-depth understanding of how this data came to be. Um, I'm going to go to the next sheet, which has column information. So as we saw briefly before, the data set we're looking at is in a tabular format. It's made of columns and rows. This is going to tell you what each one of those columns means. So you might, um, if depending on how much you've worked with different data sources before, um, you'll come to see that sometimes the column names are not always the most descriptive or you might not have a, they might be misleading in one way or another. So it's a good idea to just look here um, to know what the different columns represent. Um, again, just to understand what you're working with. So the one I'll just highlight here is unique key. Um, we can look at, at that again when we get into the data, but this is showing that this column will have a unique identifier for every service request that comes in to this data set. And in this case, each 311 service request um, it's just somebody, you know, putting in their request. So they'll all get a unique number. Um, so that's one way to look at them. Um, and we can come back to this too later if maybe we're looking at the data set and we're not sure about something. This is just a really good reference point. It will also give you expected values. So, um, you know, we have here, um, let's see, like Burrow. These are like the potential values that might be populated in that field. Um, which which could be useful, um, again, depending on what you're looking for. So I'm going to minimize this. There's more information here, but um, this is something that I just want everyone to be aware of exists in case you're ever stuck. All right. So I'm going to keep going down. Um, we're going to continue talking about what's in this data set, because just so we can get familiar with this page a bit more. Um, as mentioned, you know, we just learned that each row um, coming in is going to be a service request. It has that unique identifier. In total, we have 32.5 million rows. That means 32.5 million service requests. And there's going to be 41 columns. So all the columns are listed out here. Um, this gives the name, a brief description of what that column is, and then the type of data that it is. For example, is it text? Is it going to be a date time format? Um, and you can open up, sorry, and see all the different columns that we're going to have here. Um, and you'll see at the bottom too, we have latitude and longitude. Um, that means there's some spatial information about this data as well. Um, so there's going to be a lot here. And then at the bottom, um, this just gives you a preview um, of what that looks like once we have that data all together in a table. So from here, I'm going to come back to the top. And we're going to start to explore that data now. So now that we have an idea of what's going on in the data set, how the data came to be, and what to expect, I um, feel that we're ready to jump in a bit more. So I'm going to click this first button, View Data. And it's going to take a sec to load. And all right, for this demo, um, I'm going to click up here, switch to Grid View. This is just going to change the interface a little bit. Um, there's multiple ways to view this. And just for this demo, I'm going to be working here. Let me just make my screen. All right. So um, now that we're in this view data page, um, we can kind of explore this data a little bit more. Um, at the bottom of my screen here, you'll see, again, this is showing through on one service requests, one to 100 out of 32.5 million. So um, for me, and probably for most purposes, that's going to be a lot of data to work with. If I were to, you know, once I'm in here, I can do different things with it. I can analyze the data directly on this site, or I can take the data and export it out and bring it into my own system. Um, a common thing to do is get some data and bring it into Excel and then work with it there, for example. Um, if I tried to do that with 32.5 million rows of data, um, Excel would would not have a good time um, 
my computer would crash pretty quickly. Um, and it's also a lot to work with. It's yeah, so it's a good idea to find ways to maybe break down your data set a little bit to make it a bit more manageable, and then also find things you might want to work on. So for this, what we're going to do is we're going to add some filters, and this will allow us to um, find a data set that's kind of what we're looking for and something that's easier to work with. So I have filter selected. I'm going to scroll down, and these options here allow us to sort our data a bit. So the first thing I'm going to add is let's go to borough. I'm going to filter all of these requests to only requests coming in for Queens because I saw someone in the chat earlier it was from Queens. So what I did was selected borough, chose an operator. In this case, is um, you could also do the opposite, is not, um, or a few other choices. And then I typed in Queens in the field text. And you'll see now the total request count at the bottom dropped to 7.5 million. So we've reduced it a fair amount. Um, let's add another one. So I can either here select another borough, say I want to do Queens and Brooklyn, but I want to I want to narrow down instead of expanding this further. So I'm going to just add a new filter entirely. Um, let's do Agency. Does anyone have a favorite city agency? I can filter on that. Parks. Yes, I love the parks too. Okay. Um, let's see. I'm going to actually switch. Is there, I think DPR? Sorry, I'm totally forgetting what their acronym is. Is that correct? Let's find out. All right. Sorry. Filter is taking a minute to load, but. Um, we shall see. If anyone wants to take a guess at how many results we'll have after this, <laughs> we'll give it a minute to, to filter through. Here we go. All right. Parks. Okay, cool. Um, I just wanted to confirm that the agency and the name were matching up. So awesome. That brought our results down to 400,000. Oh, wow. Nice job, Leah, who got that almost perfect. Um, all right, and let's add one more filter just because 400,000 is still a pretty high number. Um, I'm going to do create a date, and we know that this data is updated pretty frequently. So I'm going to just add a filter to see how many um, service requests came in in the past this year. So we're only in March, so we'll do is after. And this one, since it had since it's a date field, um, we get a little calendar that pops up. So I can just come back to January 1. And then once I click out of this, it'll run that query. And let's see. The total in this case, still, still running. If anyone, oh, there we go. 3,551. Um, so depending on you know what your experience working with data is, that might be a reasonable starting point. You might want to filter it down even further. Um, you can see here, the next field we have is complaint type. Maybe we only want to see, I don't know, things pertaining to trees or animals. Um, there's a lot of different ways, really any, any column that we have here could be filtered down. So it really just depends on what you're looking for, but, um, I'll stop filtering this data set here. So we can say, for example, if I was content with my results, we now have you know, any service request for the parks in Queens from this year. Um, at this point, you know, I could I could look at my data in this format here, but it's kind of hard to come to really any consensus or conclusion from this. I just have a lot of rows of information. Um, so one thing that I might do is at the top of my page, I can click export. And here you'll see a bunch of different options. Um, this allows you to just take this data out of this site and into your own hands. So if you're working with this data, um, my guess, I think like one of the most common ways that this gets used would be to export this into Excel. Um, we have CSV for Excel right here. Um, you can just click that and you'll get a new CSV on your computer um, to work with. 
there's different formats as well. So if I scroll down, you'll see a few other options. Um, there's also APIs, if that is something you are familiar with working with or interested in. Um, you can learn more about that up there. Um, but once you have this, then it's in your hands and you can look at the data um, however you wish. Um, that is the quick how to get it out. Um, one thing I want to look at next is what if I you know, want to continue visualizing it here? So one thing that's really cool um, is that the open data site has a visualization tool available for anybody to use for free directly in this portal. So we're going to come and check that out. Um, it's going to be this next tab right next to export. And from here, I'm just going to launch a new visualization. So you have the option to sign in. I'm just for this demo, I'm not going to, but if you're using this frequently, you can make an account um, and then access them. Just minimize that. Um, so once I'm in here, um, the first thing I want to just note is we have this visualization dashboard up front and center. Um, but I'm going to come down and you'll see we have our tabular data once again listed here. You'll notice immediately that the total count of records is back to our 32 and a half million. Um, what I was saying before about exporting my data into Excel, um, I mentioned that 32.5 million was a very large and overwhelming number to work with. The same thing is going to apply to this visualization tool. If I started running reports on this data set right now, it's going to run pretty slowly and possibly crash. Um, so just like before, I'm going to filter my data a bit um, once I'm in here. Um, all right. So. Up on my right hand side, we have filters. Um, I'm going to just add, I'm just going to add a date filter um, just for this first example, just to keep the total a bit more manageable. And then we can build from there. So I'm going to do the same one. Um, you'll see here we actually have more advanced um, date selection tools. We can either choose um, a range in the top, or I can do a relative date, which is pretty neat. Um, so I'm going to do a relative one. I'm going to say anything this month and click apply. And I'm just going to close that so it's no longer, you know, blocking my screen. And now you'll see our total records is 87,000. So let's work with that. Let's see if we can handle that amount of data and go from there. So on this screen, um, you'll see on the left, we have a data selector tool. This will allow us to select any one of our columns to visualize. And once I select that, um, I'll have options to break it down further. And I'll then have options to choose how that data is displayed. Um, so at the top of my screen, um, we have these icons just representing different types of visualizations. So ones you have, may have seen before, like bar and pie charts. Um, we have scatter plots. We also have a mapping tool, which I love. Um, it's Really, really powerful. Um, a lot of the tools here um, are, are like truly, this is a really, really cool resource. Um, I've worked with like a bunch of fancy data analysis tools before and this this does a lot. So I would definitely check it out. Um, we're gonna start with just a bar chart. So I selected that at the top. And for my dimension, I'm gonna just break this down by borough. And immediately we have a little chart on our screen. So what we're seeing here is a count of rows um, broken down by borough. So this is saying how many complaints have come in for each borough. And then we know from our filter that this is just in this past month. Um, so immediately we can see we have the most, the highest count of service requests is coming in from Brooklyn, followed by Queens, followed by Manhattan. Um, and that was just selecting by selecting dimension. Uh, or sorry, selecting borough from the dimension list. Um, I'm going to switch it quickly and just see, let's do the same thing for agency and see what we get. Um, so now we can start to see a few other records. Um, the number of complaints coming, or sorry, service requests coming in by different city agencies. Um, I can, we can add in a different additional values. So if I want to, sorry, I'm going to go back a second. I'll do borough and break this down by 
agency that work? Oops. All right. I'm going to backtrack that one really quickly. Um, from here, what I'm going to do is um, we're going to come into, we're going to check out a few different um, ways to check these out. So I'm going to come into, move over to a pie chart, um, just another way to see that same data. Um, we can also come over to a map. Um, and you'll see that this one broke my visualization. So um, with the last one, we were doing a simple count by agency. Um, and so that was well suited for you know the, the other types of visualizations that we saw. With the map one, um, the tool didn't really know how to work with the data we were feeding it. Um, so I'm going to come over here and just change my settings a little bit. Um, Actually, sorry, I think with the map, it tends to break when I have this many results. So I'm just going to add in like one more filter. Um, we're going to bring back our parks. So I'm just adding. All right. Sorry, my filter is being a little unresponsive. Hey, Laura, sometimes this yeah. might happen especially um, if the page is currently processing. So usually what looks oh, like a blank is yeah. probably processing. My my neat little trick anytime I, I get caught up in um in some of the processing is to duplicate the tab. You just do a little right click, duplicate, and then it, it allows you to start fresh at least. Oh, that's smart. You know, I do this, this is not the first time I've made this mistake. <laughs> I always <laughs> I always see it's blank and I'm like, let me filter it now and then come back. Um, yeah. And the very, I mean, and you look like you did it as well, because I saw that your filter was already uh, first considering time. So yeah, the first thing we do here is always to constrain the time that we're looking at. Otherwise, we're, we'll be processing 32 million rows. So we try to constrain that time first. And then once that's done, we can visualize. Yes, thank you. Oh, I need that reminder like every day of my life. <laughs> All right, so I've done the our trick, I've reopened this. Um, I'm going to be selecting. Oops. So I've just filtered down a bit further. So I have this month agency DPR. Now we only have a thousand. Um, hope not. Let's add one more filter. I'm going to add just so that we can make it through this without any hiccups. I'm going to just add queens. And so now our total result is 654. And I'm going to let this load for a moment. And I'm going to close my last yep. one. Definitely let it load. It'll, it'll, it'll come to us, so no worries. <laughs> and um, some things I'll add while this is processing is that um, if you're in the visualization feature and you're signed in and you actually sign up for an account, you can actually save your work and be able to reproduce any map that you create at any time and share with others. So it's really helpful to sign up for an account um, and be able to save your work, especially if it takes some time to process. Let's see. All right, so I'll give this another moment. Um, if anyone has any other questions while this loads, feel free to send them through. Um, yeah, feel free to type in the chat. Um, Laura, if you if you want to let this process in the background, you could probably work off of a different tab and we can answer some other questions that people may have. Yeah, of um, course too. Yeah. All right. So um yeah, actually, well, sorry, while this loads, um, one thing I'll just note here is the um options I did before were really quick. Um I don't want to say basic in a bad way, but you know, it allowed us to get some results pretty quickly. But as you explore this more, you'll see on the left hand side, um, there's just more options to further refine the results and um, just visualize your data in different ways. So once you're in here, um, you can really start to explore and find um, different, like unique ways to visualize and better understand the data that you're working with. So I'm just giving like a brief overview now is all I'm saying, but there's there's a lot um, of intricacy here that you can work with. All right, so I'm gonna keep letting this load. We can come back to this. Um, hopefully it loads soon. <laughs> and let me just reopen this. All right, so I think this is 
Good timing. So I think I just saw somebody ask what um, other folks have been using this data um, to do or what projects have they worked on using this data. Um, so from here, some things I want to show are going to be some tools that use open data as well as some projects um, that others have used using open data. So I'm going to, oops. All right. So the first one, sorry for the back and forth there. Um, is going to be this page, uh, which is why I was trying to end with maps. We can see some other maps that have used open data, so we'll get there in one way or another. Um, but nyc.gov slash maps, which I will throw in the chat. Um, oops. Um, this site will give you a gallery which has many maps, um, which were created by city agencies to just make their data more accessible. Um, so I'm going to Pop in here. All right. So this page, um, I'm just going to scroll down a bit. You can just see there's a wide variety of different maps available. Um, this one used to be my favorite one, Plow NYC. It would have live feeds of where all the snow plows were around the city. I guess we didn't really get a ton of snow this year, so I didn't. I don't know if I looked at it once this year, but that used to be a favorite. Um, one that I will quickly demonstrate is this one. This is our NYC street tree map. So I have this one ready here. This one um, I like to demonstrate since it's one that I used um, in my neighborhood. So I'm going to just minimize this. You can see here, um, if I zoom out, this map is just taking um, data, which has point data collected against every tree in the city, um, any one of our NYC street trees. So when I zoom out, you can see a total count. So in Manhattan, we have 95,000 trees mapped, 128,000 in the Bronx, et cetera. And as I zoom in, um, this will start to get broken down by different um, neighborhood zones. And it's a little slow to load, but as I get closer, you'll see this switches over to points. Um, so each record in this data set that this is referencing has a tree as their record. So if I were to click on one of these points, a bunch of facts about that tree will open up. Um, it'll have an ID number, a trunk diameter. Something that's really neat is it has, it's linked up so you can get a street view of the tree. Um, and it has some ecological benefits. So it's kind of nice to see, oh, what is this tree doing for us? Um, and then it also has a tree care activity. So in my neighborhood the other year, there was a group that organized a bunch of volunteers to pick a tree and take care of it for the summer to keep it watered. So we were able to use this data set to identify trees under a certain diameter, which were considered to be like at higher risk of not surviving. So I kind of filter these out. Um, you'll see these are our smaller trees in this, you know, multi-block radius. Um, so we use this open data set to pick what were considered more vulnerable, vulnerable trees and then assign different volunteers to take care of them during, during the summer. Um, so I thought this data set was pretty cool and it was neat to see it have like a direct real world counterpart there. Um, and it's just fun to look at all the trees because sometimes it feels like there aren't many in the city, but it's nice to see them all represented here that way. Um, so that is one example on the map page. Um, there are, and again, these are just a few examples of like city sponsored data sets that made their way here. Um, a few, like one other that I'll point out that I think is really, really cool is the population fact finder. Um, this pulls in a lot of census data, so you can get a lot of um, oops, data recorded against different neighborhoods um, and start to learn more about here. I'm not going to go into this one too in depth just because it's there's a lot here, but um, this is one tool that I found incredibly helpful and eye-opening, so I'd recommend checking this one out. Um, all right. 
So the next thing I'm going to go to, and all those maps that I went through before were in that map link that was shared in the chat. Um, the next one that I'm going to share is this page. So this is um, open data slash projects. And this is a project gallery um, of just different projects <laughs> um, that are using NYC open data. Um, so this is really another really great way to get some inspiration, see what others are working on. Um, and also, you know, keep in mind that if you are working on your own project and come up with something that you think others might find interesting or useful, um, you can submit it to have it added here as well. Um, so there's a lot of really great resources here. Um, the one that I can highlight, um, I'll look at this one, Crash Mapper. Um, let's, um, all right. So this one, um, when I come to this page, um, gives a bit of an overview of how this project came to be. Um, it lists out the data that was used in this project and then how it was built. Um, and then right over here, I have this button to launch the project. So this is just a screenshot of it. I'm just gonna open it up quickly. Um, and this is mapping different traffic accidents that have happened throughout the city. Um, so this could be you know, a really valuable tool um, in terms of city planning or um, just potentially like working in your neighborhood to identify more high risk areas or different intersections that have been really problematic or really dangerous. Um, so if you're looking like just to see what's happening in the city, each one of these points is gonna represent a crash and the way it's visualized just has larger points represents multiple crashes. So if I come down to this area, you can see like a cluster of accidents. Um, it's again, a bit heavy of a data set since these represent like actual incidents that have happened, um, but could be a really powerful tool in saying, hey, this this is an area that may need that may need help. Um, and like we learned earlier, you know, a lot of the data we're looking at right now, there's so much of it. Um, again, a lot of these tools will have ways to further filter the data. Maybe I only want to see incidents involving cyclists, or um, maybe I want to break my data set down by one of these boundary types. Um, this is like a pretty neat way that this tool was designed to allow you to filter and make this data more tangible in that way. And okay, just going back to my slide. Um, all right, sorry. And then, sorry, back to the um, projects page, you'll see there's many, many different topics. You know, the data we looked at comes from many different sources. So there's a lot, a lot to look through here and a lot to um, check out. So I'm going to check quickly if my map from earlier has loaded. Unfortunately, it has not. Um, all right. I'm going to leave this one pending a bit longer. Um, and we can continue to check up on it. <laughs> um, but seeing as we have about 30 minutes left, um, from here, you know, there's other tools we could explore if anyone's interested in, sorry, there it is any specific ones or specific data sets they want to look at. Um, but for now, I'm going to um, open this up to questions. So let me see if there's any in the chat. Or if there's anything as well, like specific, you want to look at further. Um, here's where we can jump back into. So we do have a few um, yeah. questions in the chat. Um, <clears throat> so someone asked uh, with an account, if there would be a log of all activity to assist getting back to a given point. Uh, I do believe so. I do believe there are some, there is some level of undo and redo as you're working through your project. Um, I think you'll be able to see that as you're making changes in the visual, in the visualization feature. Um, otherwise, <clears throat> I think the best way to save your work is to actually intentionally go and save and you can save a 
particular view at a certain state, um, do some more work. You can save another view under a different name. So that way you can have your work at different places as well. You, 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 you'll have the ability to save as many times as you want. Uh, so you can go back to your work at different states and then clean it up all later by deleting um, certain views that you don't need anymore. There's also another question um, about um, exporting some of the visualization. So um, is it possible perhaps to show maybe like the bar chart or something that was like actually working in yes. pretty snappy first? <laughs> Let's get one working. Yeah, because maybe the map is, is a little bit heavy. Um, also, yeah. you have to remember, this is probably our most popular data set on the entire portal. So not only are we processing 32 million rows, but there are thousands of individuals who have saved their own views of this data. That also has to process. And they also saved a lot of visualizations as well, which also has to process. So sometimes it could be slow, especially around Open Data Week. Yeah, so I'm going to go through, um, and I saw in the chat someone else asked about, I'm trying to reread it, but um, the first few steps of selecting data set and setting visualizations. Um, this is not going all the way back to the beginning, but we can talk about that a bit more. Mm -hmm. But I can review these filters a bit more here since there's, there's a lot of options. Um, a lot of times, I guess, going back to selecting a data set, um, if I had a certain project in mind, um, I might look through the different data sets available that might address that topic. Um, for example, through on one complaints, I, I like the park theme because um, I think we've looked at that a little bit now. Maybe I want to see like through on one complaints um, that got assigned to the parks department um, pertaining to like tree, tree quality, something like something along those lines. Um, or say, yeah, say I'm like working in my community. I want to know more about like, where are their damaged trees? So I might come in here. Um, I would select my agency is DPR. Um, oh, really slow. Um, if it's giving you a little trouble, you could probably try to do a tab refresh just to start fresh. Yeah. Just in case if it's giving you, yeah, right there. Close some of these too. Okay. I think I just have a lot open. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to add a filter um, for agency. There we go. Thank you. No, yep, no problem. DPR. Um, we can just choose. Say we want to like focus in on a certain area. I could do incident zip, um, and this will make it you know really honed in. Um, one 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 zero one. This I think that's in Queens, maybe. Um, just to chime in, I also recommend narrowing the time period. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm going to do that first, yeah, actually. <laughs> yeah, definitely agree. Yeah. Um, so, time time so, period first, because we're working with 32 mil. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, for the time period, I think it's also something you want to think about when selecting, when thinking about what you're trying to address. So if I want to know, like, what's what's the biggest issue in my neighborhood now? I might choose the most recent week. May I want to understand what's happening over time. May I go further back? Um, I'll just do, to make this small, I'll do this week. Um, and I'm just gonna remove that filter if it's not working. Oh, sorry, computers. Yeah, no worries. Let's see, let's see what today. it's doing so far at the bottom. Is it changing for us? It is it's just still uh, at a million. Yeah, and it's gonna take some oh, time to process. Oh, oh, hmm. Well, it's probably calculating different things, but yeah, by far, yeah. Uh, because this is our largest data set that we have on the portal, or at least one of the largest um, in terms of column width and um, row count. Uh, definitely start any filtering by constraining your time frame. That is the very first filter you should do when you get here. I'm gonna just. I'm gonna take a little back step and just try to. Yeah, no problem. See if this can get going. Maybe try a slightly wider frame, like let's say a month. All right, there we go. Hey, Thank you. Works. Yes. All right. All right, things are working this time. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Looking up. <laughs> um. Um. We can do complaint type by showing it on a bar chart, or you could uh, 
Yeah, you could drop it and let's see what it looks like on a bar chart. Okay, so. So yeah, right now from my dimension, I chose complaint type. You'll see it's a cutoff. So I, I have the option to move that over a little bit. Um, okay. So now we can see our top complaint here. Um, just this month from the DPR are damaged trees and new tree requests. Um, so maybe I want to see a little bit more about that. I'm going to add in. Oh, actually, sorry. Our question before I got a little sidetracked was um, exporting our visualizations, correct? Yeah. Okay. Um, I am trying to remember if I've actually done that from here or not. No worries. So this is a working session for us both. Um, trying to remember. Before, I guess, to take a step there. So say say I've chosen my different um, parameters and I was happy with, you know, a count of complaints regarding, uh, sorry, count of requests coming in by complaint type. And this was what I wanted to visualize. I could add in a few extra things. So thanks. And make this, you know, flesh it out a little bit. Um, you can also change the settings. I'll make it green for the parks. Um, you can add in, you know, just change additional settings here. Um, and I'm going to, from here actually. By chance, are you logged in? I'm not logged in. So I, I'm realizing I don't know that I have the option when I'm not logged in. Okay. Cause yeah. normally what, what the portal will do with, um, after your work, it will ask you um, to save it as a view. And then I do know that there is an export option. I think once you save this as its own chart, from there, you're, you're um, able to get a link and then share it. You can embed it on a different website. You can also share a map as well. All right. So that's, I think, a quick downside to doing the non-logged in route here. Right. There's um, some there's some easy sharing features that you don't get yeah. because it has to be associated with, and saved to your account in order to share with others. Um, yeah. One quick thing I will point out here. Um, so yeah, I would recommend for that to log in. Um, one thing to note though is you know we filled we did all the work of filtering down our data set and creating this visualization. You can also come here and go back to view the data source, um, which is pretty neat. Um, all right, and I think I'll leave this example there since I can't really, since I'm not logged in, so I can't actually export it from this point. Um, and let me, all right, I'm gonna go back through the questions a little bit because I feel like I might've missed some things. And we could help there too as well, like just call out some other ones we saw. Yeah. Um, so, uh, we did talk about visualization. We did do a little bit of the steps, um, how to get to visualizations from the open data page. And I think we answered the question about projects other analysts have worked on. Are there any other questions that we could possibly cover for you folks? Feel free to type it in the chat. We do have some time. We, this is the our dedicated section for questions. I saw um, Laura in the chat, you asked about, um, the steps of selecting and setting visualizations. If you have any further on that, I can we can always dive deeper as well. I think it's it, perhaps it would be helpful to just start in a new tab to show people how to get from the catalog, land on a data set, what buttons to select. Yeah. It'll probably just be helpful. So I'll come back. Um, Let's start I'll from just the, go back. Yeah, the catalog. Yeah. All right. Let me, I'm just gonna close one or two things to make this run a bit faster. So I'm gonna just explore, um, I'm back on the homepage and I'm just gonna do most popular data sets since I'm curious. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I'll give it a moment to load. All right. So if I'm starting from the top, um, my filter is set right now on most accessed. So that's how they're determining popular. Um, we have all these records just in that order. Um, on the left, we get those, we get some similar filters that we saw on the 
the, like the data welcome page. So different um, categories to break them down. Um, I'm just gonna further refine this a bit. Let's look at environment from this list. Oh, that's fun. <laughs> um, and from here, when I'm looking at the different data sets available, if I'm just exploring um, the things I would keep an eye out for would first just be this, um, this tab here, which gives us that category that it's in. Everything right now is gonna be sorted on environment, but if I didn't have that selected, um, that's like a quick snapshot of what category we fall under. And then the other things that I might look at are the tags. Um, and one that immediately stands out that I wanna check out is just gonna be, let's look at air quality, cause I'm kind of curious. So once I'm in this data set, um, I'll get this overview, but, and I can just tell the first thing we learn is that this is gonna be about New York City air quality data that's coming in. Um, I can see something that's, some things that differ here from the 311 data set is that the update frequency is as needed. Um, so that that's something that I would be curious about when I start to look at this data. We can also see the last time it was updated is April, 2022 which in comparison to the 311 data, that, that's updated every day automatically. And the last update was within the last 24 hours. So this already is a bit different. So if I knew I was doing, if I wanted to know about our current air quality levels, maybe this, maybe this is helpful to understand you know, general issues, but it might not be the most up-to-date um, resource available, but it could be a good, maybe it's a good starting point, or maybe it is, maybe it is, good, but those are just things to keep keep in mind. Um, when understanding it, I would again look at how many records we're working with. Again, this is a lot smaller than our 311 data. Um, I would do the same thing as before. I would look at all the columns available to understand um, what these what data is available. Um, and then same as before, I would look at the user guide, or sorry, the uh, the data dictionary, just because I don't personally really know what, at this point, even like an individual record is. Um, so I think that's like my most important thing is, you know, I, I can see here that we have a bunch of unique identifiers, we have indicator IDs, um, but the rest of the data I'm just not familiar with. So for something like this, I would go further and look at this data dictionary just to understand if this is what I'm looking for. Um, my first thought is this might not be, this might be like a bit advanced to just explore um, since it looks pretty like technical um, and I'm not familiar with many of these values. So I think in addition to understanding what the data is, um, is understanding, you know, what, what could I do with this? What are my options? Um, I'm seeing there's some like geographic data. So maybe I could start to map out these indicators, but I think for me personally, I need to do a bit more research on what that actually actually stands for um, before going further with it. Um, so maybe this is a bit challenging of a data set to explore on the fly, <laughs> but um, I can take a quick look at their PDF. Yeah, so this has to do with like fine particulate matter um, concentrations. So yeah, I'm not sure I would, um, I guess this this goes back to understanding your data and what you can do with it. I think for me, my next step would be, if I'm really curious, I would need to do a bit more work on what's actually in here and learning about that first. Um, so I'm gonna close this. Yeah, but... getting, getting started with that data, you probably have to look at that user guide a bit longer, but yeah, I wouldn't know exactly where to start, maybe where to start visualizing, especially. But I think it's just aggregated, um, measurements of pollutants it's interesting what, what throws me for a loop a little bit is not only are they measuring pollutants but they're also measuring by the estimated annual rate and by people at a certain age bracket and older so i would probably really need like dohmh uh department of health help in understanding how to get started using this data though but it is interesting yeah this looks cool um but yeah i think um you know, a lot of what's really helpful here is just the information's here. You just need to take the time to mm -hmm. pop in and research that. 
some uh, other cool data sets i mean my personal favorite is restaurant inspections those are normally another one that's like filterable um you could go ahead and yeah just type restaurant inspection yeah so just to find that i just searched restaurant in the search bar um this happened to be the first result that came up um and yeah you can give a quick glance here updated daily um right but when you dive into the data as well as just getting familiar with it this is also a pretty helpful cool data set to dive into with restaurant grades i personally um don't necessarily go into the details of well, yes, I do use some of the ratings, but also my favorite thing to do is find <laughs> out cuisines that I'm not really aware of because it, it does have a rich list of um, cuisine types, as in like cuisine description. You can see um, if you scroll through the data set, it does have some interesting results. Yeah, so one time I actually aggregated the data for unique values here just to see what kind of cuis cuisines was out there. And I just picked one at random with a decent rating and I actually uh, went out to dinner, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I think definitely one of the wonders of the open data platform is that there are these really specialized data sets that professionals can really enjoy playing with. And at the same time, there's like these more casual data sets that you can kind of just go through for fun and to really enjoy. Yeah, definitely. I think, I, I don't know if anyone noticed, but I think one of the ones that came up before when I looked at most popular was a squirrel census, which is definitely a silly data set, but, but pretty fun. <laughs> um, oh yeah, so I saw the question, if I use this platform, do you not need to use SQL or Python? Nope. Yeah, everything um, I did today was no code. Um, if I open up just this visualized tool, um, again, for the restaurants in this case, um, Everything here is really drag and drop and select from drop downs. Um, so you don't need to know how to code to start diving in. Um, not to say you couldn't do more of this if you wanted, but um, in its current state, you could, you can really do a lot just with the options that were given here. Um, another thing I want to point out. So Shade had a, a, a question. Um, the data is accessible um, externally especially if you go to export, uh, you could show, this is just for the crowd of folks that are a, a bit more advanced and want to access the data. So we do have an API endpoint that you could reach out for. If you were to grab this URL here that we're showing you and post it into your browser, you would actually get the raw data, um, I think in JSON format. And from there, um, the portal actually does allow you to query uh, data as well. So you can actually use select statements similar to SQL. It's not exactly SQL on this portal It's called SQL, but um, you can build queries. And the API, there are API documentation to also access the data with Python as well. Yeah, so I'm just trying to pull that back up. But yeah, that's all. You can get all that documentation just under that export tab here. Um, and then I think um, yeah, I saw one comment in the chat about um, a data set with important fields missing. Um, I can't speak to that data set in particular, but um, my first point of reference would be going to that data dictionary to see if there's any information, if it's excluded intentionally or not. Um, and if that doesn't provide guidance, there is a contact us page that I'll go to right here. Um, and you can fill out, um, uh, sorry, you can send a note in, I forgot the word, um, you can send a note here to get clarity on um, perhaps like an error that you've noticed, or maybe you have a question just to get clarification on what is going on with that data set. Um, and somebody from the open data team will get back to you. Yep. Um, and this is a monitored, this is a monitored form. Uh, by myself and my team, we're actually monitoring it. So if you're able to send us a note along with a corresponding URL to a data set, we can route your question to the appropriate agency and get you a response. So feel free to use that link that Dimitri popped into the chat. Yeah. So if there aren't any other questions, I do think we're 
getting close to our time. Um, you do have a way, all of you, to, on how to access um, help and get support for any of your open data questions. Perhaps we should return to the slide and um, just see yes. what else we can let people know about regarding Open Data Week. All right. Oh, so this is just a quick refresh on that uh, help page. And I can turn this over um, to you all if you want to handle the rest of yep. Open um, Data Week. Dimitri, sure. Would you like to say a bit? Yeah. Yes. Um, first of all, thank you so much all for joining our Open Data class tonight and for staying through with us. It was really awesome. And shout out to Laura for being an awesome Open Data Ambassador today, claps. <laughs> um, yes, so thank you again for coming out to Open Data Week and joining this Open Data class. We'll continue to have several different Open Data Week events throughout the week. It's a week-long festival, a week-long data festival, where we hold several um, in-person and virtual events, most of which are free for you to join in and participate and to explore data with us. Um, we also have an awesome conference to close off Open Data Week on Saturday called the School of Data, where you can access all kinds of awesome, interesting, informative sessions on everything data related throughout the day. And we really encourage you to attend that. Um, I'll be posting the links for these events in the chat. So feel free to access them and show up. We'd love to see you. And we really enjoyed having you here tonight. So yeah, yeah definitely. Want to second that. What a second what Dimitri's there, especially School of Data. For all of you um, who have analytic backgrounds, programming backgrounds, there's different courses to show you. You know, I had some questions that I think uh, would be pretty relevant to that day um, about accessing APIs, using different languages to access and wrangle open data. Um, an excellent place for you to uh, plan your day out and be able to participate if you have your own laptop. So great opportunity there, as well as other open data um, events all throughout. Um, again, as we said, this, uh, this presentation, as well as all the other events for the Open Data Week, were put together by the Office of Technology and Innovation, Open Data Team, as well as the Civic Tech Group, Beta NYC. You can reach out and stay in touch with Beta NYC um, for their government tech talks, if that's of interest. And also look out for the Code for America, excuse me, Code for America National Day of Civic Hacking. Um, especially for all you analysts out there that really want to uh, work and network with some like minds. Um, great opportunity there as well. Um, Laura, if you could go to the next slide, you this is will be the link where you can access all of that. Beta.nyc forward slash links. Got the Slack newsletters, um, events on a calendar. So you can stay in touch that way. And you can always reach out to my team, the open data team uh, in the city of New York for open data related questions on any data sets, any issues that you're encountering. We have our form and we actually monitor it and we actually route your questions to real city agencies for responses.